Hey everyone, Brian Zane here with my review of WWE Evolution. Of course, uh, this show was lauded as the company's first ever all-women's pay-per-view, their first foray into doing that kind of show, and obviously not the first one of its kind in the genre. Many other companies have beaten WWE to the punch uh, over the years, uh, by, by several years in fact, so this is nothing new in professional wrestling, but it is a relatively big deal for the standard bearer of professional wrestling in the country to be doing this. It's kind of finally kind of breaking that glass ceiling so to speak. Uh, this was a very, just I'll say right off the top of the, off the, top of the show, very entertaining show overall from top to bottom. I think that this show greatly exceeded the hype that went into it, especially given all the, well, the, I say all the build, all the terrible build, the negative amount of build that went toward this show. There, the, the build for this was so bad, especially because they had to, they, they put all their priority, put all their eggs into the crown jewel basket and so evolution really suffered as a result like the whole contrast of evolution and crown jewel it's like there's so many different layers to the dichotomy of those two shows and it just came out in all these multitude of terrible ways over the last couple of weeks but we finally got evolution under our belts and it's done and i think it was a great step forward it was a great showing uh, by the company and the talent involved the, the women clearly uh, you know, compensated, overcompensated for the lack of build with what went on in the ring, but in a perfectly good way. The show begins with a live musical performance by Lizzie Hale and Nita Strauss singing about evolution. This is the strangest blocking for a musical act or a band I've ever seen, because you have one person in the ring, the other on the ramp, and the drummer is back by the stage. Is the bassist somewhere in the rafters? I'm kind of surprised they opened the show with this matchup here, because you have the legends, the Hall of Famers, Trish Stratus and Lita, going against Alicia Fox and Mickey James, accompanied by Alexa Bliss. Of course, the big news over the weekend was Alicia Fox replaced Bliss because uh, Bliss got injured uh, some time ago at a house show by Ronda Rousey. Hmm, you would think they would keep these two apart from each other in the ring in the future, but hey, you know, accidents happen, right? That's what everyone says when someone gets hurt, right? Anyway, uh, we get the Mickey Trish face-off early in the show and the crowd is just amped for it. And by the way, I will probably repeat this throughout the night. The crowd for this show was just amazing. I know there's a lot of complaints that this particular crowd, this particular arena, historically not a great wrestling crowd, but this crowd was definitely into it throughout the whole course of the night. Back into this match, now going to come. Oh! The cutoff of the match comes when Alexa Bliss comes in and yanks Lita off the top rope when she's going to go over the moonsault. Um, near the end of the match, Trish hits the Stratus Faction on Mickey James, and oof, I felt so bad for Alicia here because she missed her cue. She dove in late to break up the pin, and when it was clearly a three count, and she breaks in, and the crowd kind of shit on her for that. Um, Mickey eats all the finishers. She gets like two more from, from Trish and Lita, and that's how the match ends. Um, I'm going to give it one and a half stars after the Legends win. The nostalgia factor was cool, seeing Trish and Lita back in the ring together uh, for the first time in years was really funny. Seeing them pull out all their greatest hits was a lot of fun to watch, but there's a, f a few too many hiccups in this match that took what was an okay match, kind of knocked it down a couple pegs in my opinion. It's a battle royal featuring women from the past and the present, and the winner is going to get a championship match down the line. You knew the Iconics were going to get eliminated first because they had mic time and no one else did. Uh, Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville work together for a bit until they don't. Alundra Blaze, you know, Hall of Famer here, working almost in slow motion. Watching her was really difficult to watch at times. You just saw she almost looked almost kind of lost at times. Um, you know, obviously, if someone speaking of you know Trish and Lita, women who have not wrestled in a long time, I think Alundra has even a great drought um, and so I'm you know not gonna falter for that but it's like she was she was on the hard cam side of the ring it was hard to ignore her hard to avoid seeing her in the ring and just kind of like work in the kind of half speed compared to everybody else that was really weird kind of a curious thing to have her on that side of the ring the whole time uh, a lot of women not just a lunder but pretty much like more than half the women in this match had a real hard time going over the top rope and hitting the floor in one fluid motion I counted maybe two or three people in the entire match who did that everything else was like fight 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 Oh, I'll just gently put you down on the apron and then knock you off. It was kind of like the, the Women's Royal Rumble all over again. Um, Nia and Tamina do a stare down at one point, and I think they do a little tribute to Roman Reigns. And Tamina! <laughs> I also think Lana jumps her cue at this point because, you know, you see Lana show up twice in between the two of them, 
but the first one they just ignore her and the second one then they finally do the bit where she's trying to fight them both and no one's and, and they're not selling and they finally get rid of her uh, we get a big multi-woman suplex and when everyone's down Carmel's the first one to get up she does a dance break the crowd is just going ape for it our truth is in the audience loving it as well Ivory joins in as well so that's that, was, that seemed almost kind of out of character for Ivory to do that I don't remember her doing any kind of dancing uh, when she was in her prime of the company the final five are Tamina Naya Ivory Asuka and Ember moon ivory takes too long to celebrate and she gets eliminated for her efforts uh nice stare down between asuka and ember moon there's an nxt chant nice call back to their feud there ember moon actually eliminates asuka which was very surprising it was kind of like i guess it's kind of a compensation for the fact she never beat asuka in nxt ember eliminates tamina and we are down to friends as michael cole said i don't know it's like i don't really buy it. i'm sure they're friends in real life and i know they've brought this up in commentary before that they're friends and when they've competed against each other it's been a friendly rivalry but like i don't know it's it's just, it hasn't been built up to the level of like other friend scenarios and storylines like Sasha Bailey and you know Ronda Natalia and Ronda and the Bellas and that sort of thing so I felt this one was kind of like eh okay so we think these are the final two until as they're fighting in the ropes Zelina Vega comes in the ring and tries to dump them both out she thinks she's won she is very wrong Nia picks Zelina up and tosses her out to the ring into Tamina and it does not look very good Tamina looks very hurt <laughs> on the impact of that and then Nia eliminates Ember Moon and she wins and she's got a future Raw, cha Raw Women's Championship match in the future. I'm going to give this one two and a half stars. This Battle Royal really exceeded my expectations. I was like, this is the match I was looking forward to the least. Actually, no, second to least. I'll get to that one in a little bit. But it was definitely one I was not caring that much about because I felt so many of the women in that match could have been booked into a better position, into a better state than they were with this. You feel it was just like, yes, this is the match where any woman who's not in a main program gets some chance to shine on the pay-per-view because we have to get everyone involved. And, you know, to that extent, it worked. I think everyone, to, to an extent, did get a chance to shine and, for the most part, look good. Um, and, you know, like I said, a lot of entertaining spots. Some people got more of a chance to do their thing than others, like Carmella doing the dance break, for example. Um, I would have liked, I think, Ember to win. I think she was she was my pick to win over uh, Nia Jax, certainly. Uh, that's kind of a nitpick. Um, other than that, I think it was a very entertaining match. We get the Mae Young Classic Finals as Tony Storm takes on Io Shirai. Uh, this was a great match here. I really, I have not yet watched the match between uh, Tony Storm and Meiko Satomura uh, in the semifinals. I hear that was the match to end all matches for this year's Mae Young Classic, so I really want to go back and watch that. Uh, and so I was really excited about this final as well because I know how good Io Shirai is. I know how good Tony Storm is. Yes, let's go. Let's do this thing. A lot of technical wrestling start to start the match off and then building into the stronger style stuff. Of course, Tony Storm has a lot of extensive experience in Japan, so I think she really does well in that style, working with EO like that. I got at one point they're going on the apron, and Tony hits uh, EO with like a German suplex on the apron, which was stiff as hell. EO with some big moves of her own, including a huge moonsault to the outside off the top rope. That was a thing of beauty. Uh, the match ends when Tony hits two Storm Zeros, or is it Storm's Zero? The second one comes after EO goes for her moonsault in the, in the ring, and then uh, she eats a couple of knees from Tony. So uh, Tony Storm wins the match, wins the Mae Young Classic after falling just short uh, in last year's tournament. She made it to the semifinals and lost there. And so I think it was a great redemption story for Tony. I give this match three stars out of four. Terrific match. It started off and then it built this really great crescendo. My only gripe with this match is I wish it had gone longer. I felt like it also was almost kind of cut short. Uh, they made great use of the time they had, but I felt that this match could have just been so much better if they added just as little as five extra minutes. Had more time to let things marinate and build. That's my only little gripe with it. I still think it was a great match. Six-woman tag as Sasha Banks, Bailey, and Natalya take on the squad that riots. I loved the spot early in this matchup here where Bailey's chasing after Ruby Riot. She slides. She's trying to slide through the ring in the corner, and then Sarah Logan drop kicks her right into the turnbuckle post. That is such a cool cutoff. I love that spot. Uh, Sasha goes for a plot. It does not look good, and even if she even if she hit it and cleared the apron, the Riot Squad still catch her, and then they dump her into the barricade. Uh, Ruby goes to the top rope, and then Bailey, kind of a Dusty Rhodes homage, goes to protect Sasha, protect her friend, and then Ruby's like, whatever, and just like hits them both, so they both get hurt. Uh, Natalia with a hot tag, she does a double sharpshooter, which looks somehow even more ridiculous.
listen to the Ronda Rousey double arm bar. Sasha with her own little tribute to Eddie Guerrero with the frog splash onto Liv Morgan to win the match for the baby faces. I give this one one and a half stars. I was kind of going back and forth between one and a half or two stars for this matchup. And ultimately the reason I knocked it down a peg was because as you know, as this was a good, solid match between all six women, uh, but the problem is I feel we've seen this match or some variation thereof uh, a lot on Raw for the last couple of months. So really what in this match did we see that was amazing or different or blew me away? Really there was none of that there. This was just kind of like a nothing match. Just It was a feud built on repetition. That's basically all this match was to me. You know, again, solid match. Can't take anything away from the women involved, but it was just like, okay, we've seen this before. NXT Women's Championship up next as Kyrie Sane defends against Shayna Baszler. You, you would think this is the blow-off, a possible blow-off at least, to their year-long rivalry that had ever since the finals of last year's May Young Classic. Uh, Shayna, of course, working the joint manipulation, working the arm and hand of Kyrie, and uh, Kyrie's selling is great here. These two are just, they complement each other so well because Shayna is so vicious and vile and mean, especially in this matchup here, like picking up Kyrie by the arm and swinging her around and just doing just devastating stuff to her. She looks absolutely like a killer. I love it. And Kyrie, to her credit, is selling her ass off for Shanna and making her look like a million bucks. Uh, Kyrie is still able to fight back though and hold her own. Kyrie takes some big risks in this matchup here. A huge uh, cross body off the top to the outside. That was really exciting stuff. And then we get uh, two of the four horsewomen of the MMA who aren't Ronda Rousey. Rousey, Jessamyn Duke and Marina Schaefer interfere on uh, Shayna's behalf and ultimately a kick from Duke to the head allows Shayna to lock in the clutch and she passes out and the referee calls the match uh, on behalf of Shayna. So Shayna makes history. She wins the match here. She regains the NXT Women's Championship, is the first two-time Women's Champion in NXT as a result of this. I give this match three and a half stars. Uh, this was a match that, this is the match I wanted Storm and Shirai to be. I understand why this one was this one because this had all the heat to it and all the build. Uh, and speaking of which, I mean, I, I will say this. I mentioned earlier the lack of build in this show. This was a match I thought would have got more build on NXT because, like, it's the only offering on this show that NXT has. You think you would spend more time with it. Like, you had, like, a face-off. You had a singles match from each woman. And that was pretty much it. I thought that was really lacking. And I know that's NXT style is to kind of, like, you know, less is more. But I felt that it was not enough for the build for that match, at least to represent NXT. But be that as it made the match, like I said, made up for it. Um, even the finish of getting Jessamine Duke and Marina Schaefer, I don't think detracted from it. In fact, it adds a new wrinkle to it because it shows that, you know, as badass as Shayna Baszler is and as vile and as vicious as she is, she still, like, you know, is not above of getting help from her friends. And also I thought, oh, so this is how they're going to debut the rest of the four horsewomen because we know they've been training in the Performance Center for a long time. This seems to be their kind of like their their debut moment. We've seen that ringside like for Ronda and Shayna matches in the past, but now we see them kind of in this capacity here. And I'm really curious to see how that evolves in NXT. Like I watch NXT now on a recreational level. I don't watch it for a review. I watch it because I need some wrestling to watch just like as a fan these days. So that's my, that's my outlet. And so now I'm really curious to see how Shayna Baszler is going to run things in the women's division, especially with her two friends kind of being her cronies. So I'm really excited about that. Again, uh, Kyrie looks good even in defeat. Shayna looks vicious. Great match. Here we go. SmackDown Women's Championship in a last woman standing match as Becky Lynch defends against Charlotte Flair. They say this is the first ever last woman standing match. I guess you could say that's the case for pay-per-view because I guess we're not going to include Asuka and Nikki Cross in NXT. Uh, one thing that really caught me by surprise, I guess not really surprise, was in their hype package for this match. They showed the clip of the cutting edge on SmackDown 1000 when Becky Lynch was interviewed and says, I love myself. Now, when you watch that live, you heard the crowd go, what? Yeah, they loved it. But no, in the high package, they edited a bunch of booze in. I'm like, oh, that's so blatant. I love myself. They really think we have the memory of goldfish. It was not that long ago when they had that happen. Like, how could you edit the booze in there? Oh, that was that was diabolical. Uh, anyway, uh, speaking of booze, here's some real-time booze. Charlotte Flair gets her entrance in the ring. She's booed to death. It's like very Roman Reigns-esque. And then Becky, of course, gets the hero's ovation. These ladies just beat the hell out of each other 
in the, from, from bell to bell, it was just constant chaos. Uh, Becky is the first to draw a weapon. She has a kendo stick, lays into Charlotte a few times. The ladies are hosting a chair bonanza, just throwing chairs into the ring. Becky assaults Charlotte with a chair, and we get a You Deserve It chant from the audience, which was amazing. Charlotte goes for the moonsault in the ring onto Becky through a table, but she just kind of grazes Becky and the table doesn't break. Ugh. So a do over time, Charlotte has a senton and she nails it and the table just breaks right clean in two. No little bits or nothing and just looks perfect. Ta perfect table break. Charlotte then brings in a ladder and then somehow the ladder just stands on its own for like a really long period of time. <laughs> it's at this magical standing ladder. And then like Becky, who I think is the most booze she's ever gotten since turning heel was when she pushed the ladder down for safety. Boo hoo, we like the magical ladder. We get a figure eight through the ladder, which looked creative, but when I looked at it, I was like, mm, I'm not sure what about that ladder is making the move worse, per se, because, I don't know, it just looked too safe to me. They fight in the crowd, lots of, like, forearms and chops back and forth. Becky with a huge leg drop off the top of the ladder uh, through the German announce table onto Charlotte. Wow, and if that, I couldn't believe that wasn't the finish. Uh, Becky begins to just, like, bury Charlotte with an assortment of chairs and table scraps. Charlotte rises from the rubble, and we see this look of paralyzed fear on Becky's face. It's really the one time in this entire feud I've noticed where she shows any kind of weakness or like fear or intimidation from Charlotte once she does. After Charlotte's big old comeback, which includes a spear on the floor, she goes for a moonsault to the outside, but Becky catches her, power bombs her through the table on the floor. Holy shit. Charlotte barely tries to get up. She's so close, but she falls back down before the 10 count, which makes her look very strong. I think I think she saw I think she stopped selling a little too much and got up a little too quick for a move that devastating. But you know, the story was she barely loses. Becky retains by the skin of her teeth. Oh my God, what a match. Four stars across the board. Um, this was just amazing. A terrific story, awesome, jaw-dropping moments throughout, and I think most importantly, the right woman won. Um, they just killed it. Easily the best main roster women's match in recent history, if not all time, and I don't think I'm being hyperbolic when I say that. And I, you know, I think it's easily across both main roster and NXT for that matter. Uh, you could say, you know, Sasha Bailey and NXT Brooklyn is up there, but I'd say this one topped it just because of the raw level of emotion they had in this matchup. Uh, really, nothing left for me to say except, hey, are you ready for Crown Jewel in Saudi Arabia? Everyone watching this women's pay per view? Oh my God! Like I get the idea that the company has to, they have to promote the show. Their entire business is to promote the next show. I get that, but man, it just seems like just bad timing, especially after like you could have put that plug for Crown Jewel after any other match. I know they did it once earlier, and I, they could have done it for any other match except after that one. Really, that was just ugh. By the way, in case you didn't see my announcements about it on Twitter or on Facebook, I am not touching Crown Jewel uh, this upcoming weekend. I'm not watching it. I'm not giving you predictions. I'm not going to review it. Nothing. It's gotten way too icky for me. Not watching that show. Uh, however, you will be getting Halloween Havoc 98 on Saturday, so you have that to look forward to. Well, now it's time for our main event of the evening. Let's see them trying to follow that action of the previous match. It's the Raw Women's Championship as Nikki Bella challenges the woman with the baddest takes on Crown Jewel on the planet, Ronda Rousey. Uh, Ronda opens the match here by kind of like taunting and toying with Nikki, kind of grabbing her by the arm, pretty much saying I could do the arm bar at any time, kind of controlling her like a puppet, which is pretty funny. And then as soon as they're on the outside, Nikki shoves Ronda into the post when Ronda is distracted for half a second by Brie Bella, and then she's shoved in uh, to the post again by Brie after Nikki's got the referee's attention here. Um, and so then we, just, we see a lot of Ronda getting beat up for the majority of this match almost. We get some split chance here. We get some let's go Ronda, let's go Nikki chance, which, which shows me the Bellas are far more over than some fans would care to admit even these days. Uh, Ronda goes for a cross body off the top and eats shit. We do get a very creative counter to the basement dropkick when Nikki goes to the dropkick low. Ronda just gets him and pulls herself up by the ropes. I had never seen that before. That was a really cool counter. Uh, she gets both Bellas on her shoulders and does the twisting slam thing. Uh, Brie kind of takes it on her face a little bit. Like I, She couldn't get the, 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 uh, the rotation to do a full back bump on that one, so she had to take it how she could. Nikki then gets beat up a lot. Um, then there's another cutoff where Brie tries to 
because she hits Ronda in the face, but Ronda just grabs her by the neck and throws her into the announce table, which gets up a yes chant. Uh, Ronda kicks out of the rack attack 2.0. Ronda, uh, Nikki's sitting on the top turnbuckle, and Ronda leaps up there and takes Nikki down with a rolling, whatever the hell that was, into the arm bar, and she wins after Nikki submits. I'm going to give this match one and a half stars out of four. This was, um, you know, this was a better match that I think anyone could have expected these two to have. Uh, I would have loved to see them kind of like just kill it and just prove the doubters wrong, but unfortunately this match just kind of had some issues. I mean, I think it told a good story of like Ronda in this vulnerable position where the Bella is using the two-on-one advantage and really just putting the beating on Ronda and really making her look vulnerable there. Um, I think the biggest problem that I had with this match was it got slow in the middle and then it just went longer than it should have. Like really, the double slam that Ronda did to the Bellas should have been like the emotional high point of the match leading into the arm bar finish. But then they just tacked on another five to eight minutes after that. And I was like, why? Well, you've got this position now. I think the crowd is never going to get more hot than this moment right here. And they just kind of like squandered it with, with the extended part of the finish of the match. I, I think that that was unnecessary, honestly. You know, I think that it was a solid match. I'm not taking anything away from these two women. I don't think they fucked anything up. Uh, it was it was just, it was a decent match. I think that they had the unfortunate distinction of one, going longer than they should have and not knowing when to you know quit while they were ahead. And also a very unfortunate distinction of having to follow Becky and Charlotte. My final grade for Evolution is an A- minus grade, and I am readily admitting that it is in the A-level category simply on the merit of Charlotte and Becky Last Woman Standing. That was just an incredible match. I could watch that match again and again. I could watch Becky and Charlotte do a series of Last Woman Standing matches again and again. That's how good this action was. And not to say that there were no other good matches on this show, because there obviously were. Like I said, the Battle Royal exceeded my expectations and a lot of fun moments. Uh, Storm versus Shirai, great match. Baszler versus Sane, better match. Becky and Charlotte, better than that. It was a really uh, good, you know, the order, I think, of the matches were really good. I think it built up and built up. And unfortunately, the main event kind of dipped down a bit. I, like I said, the main event went a little too long. I think they just kind of like the pacing of it was not correct near the end. That's kind of how I felt. I, again, I think a lot of it, we were just all too tired after seeing that great match right before it. Um, but yeah, I think it just went a little too long there. And the six-woman tag team match was like, it was fine, but that's about the best I could say about it because like we seen that stuff before on Raw every week for the last few months. So what are you going to do there? But like I said at the top of this review, I think it was really entertaining from top to bottom. Every match was entertaining for its own reason. Uh, the crowd was hot all night. The announce team was on point. It was kind of a refreshing change of pace to not hear Corey Graves <laughs> for a few hours. And like I said, the bill for this show really, really sucked. Like, there's no sugarcoating it. They did a bad job promoting this show, but the ladies made up for it in a big way with some great action in the ring. And, you know, what can you say? I want to see them do a woman's pay-per-view every year now. I don't I don't think they should overdo it and do it every quarter or whatever, but I think if you do it every year, I think that's a really good, you know, a really good thing for them to do. And, you know, you can talk about the hypocrisy of Crown Jewel, in juxtaposition with this show all you want, and that's a perfectly valid thing to complain about, but just on its own, just looking at this show and looking where the women of the company have come from, from, you know, from the fabulous Moolah days to the, the TNA days of the Attitude Era to the kind of like hybrid of like TNA, but still having to be, want to be treated like serious wrestlers of like the mid 2000s and the early 2010s. And now we're here, like there's been a, it's been a long bumpy road for the women of WWE. Um, and so now I feel we've reached this point where it's like it's, it's them being legitimized and them being given this huge platform. So those are my thoughts about Evolution. Let me know what y'all thought about it in the comments section below and be sure to give it a letter grade in the gimmick in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it. Subscribe to Wrestling With Regret. Buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com and check out Patreon.com slash Wrestling With Regret for exclusive perks and bonus content. I'm Brian Zane and I'll see you next time.